thank you for coming. So this presentation is a follow-up to my earlier presentation in 2015. Are you able to hear all right? Yeah? yeah. Good. Um, which was on living and working with the kink, within the kink communities, and the URL for that video is on the slide if you want it. Um, I'm presenting stage one of a research project that was designed to create some guidance for gay and bisexual male therapists about handling the challenges of living and working within the community they serve. Ethical boundary management alongside a commitment to maintaining their emotional, sexual and relational health. I take it as self-evident that therapists have a right to express their sexuality consensually and safely and that that will benefit not only themselves but that their, cli but their clients and patients will also benefit from this. In that, they will be less likely to exploit their clients for their own emotional needs. Our professional bodies have still not been offering very much in the way of practice guidance on how to manage these complex is issues. And so I think in the meantime, we need to be doing it for ourselves. So phase one of this research project, which is reported here, is an online survey that I conducted last year. Phase two will be some qualitative interviews with some of the respondents about the practical ways in which they manage their boundaries. And phase three will be uh, an analysis of that research to then generate some guideline, guidelines based on the lived experience of what actually has been working for them. Uh, I've been, having funded this first phase myself, I'm seeking external and hopefully some philanthropic funding to, for, for the remaining parts of the project because that's where the expense is going to be in paying researchers to interview and to analyse. The questions have come from a working group between Liz, Lee Chislett and David Stewart of 56 Dean Street, Robert Palmer from the Burrell Street Clinic and Survey Monkey Assistance on how to get this online from Terry Sargent who actually named the conference Gay Mental Health but he, he couldn't be at the conference which is ironic really isn't it? He gave us a great name via Facebook. So, the survey was conducted over an online, online over a six-week period, asking gay and bisexual men who work as therapists or, in, or staff in sexual health clinics and who use sex and dating apps. Grindr was used by 85% of the survey respondents, and if you're not familiar with the Grindr interface, this is what it looks like, although normally there's a few more shirtless men or blank boxes on the screen. In terms of age, we can see that most of the people were in the 26 to 55 age range. In terms of profession, most people were counsellors and psychotherapists. There were a couple of other sexual health staff, but that's really where most of us were gathered. How long have they been doing the work? 60% of the respondents have been in practice over five years. Which gay apps do they use? Great. I've said 85% have been using Grindr, and Scruff was the next most popular at 47%. I asked a question, do you have a face pic on your profile? Roughly half of the people responding chose to remain anonymous. A bold 55% show their faces. And for me, there is a bit of a tension about whether one writes a fairly bland and discreet profile text, but puts a clear face pic on it, or whether you actually say what you're looking for because you might be looking for things that are a bit more transgressive and then protect your identity from your clients and your colleagues by not putting your face on your profile. Um, showing your face does perhaps mean that you're uh, less likely for clients to inadvertently message you and could be seen as good modelling. However, sex-negative clients might be quite judgmental if they see their therapist online a lot by their definition of what a lot means. So it's really not an easy decision. When using the apps, do you mostly approach others or wait to be messaged? And 53% both message and wait to be approached. A more passive approach could mean you're lowering your risks of inadvertently messaging a client and not being seen as predatory or needy. And they're interesting value judgments I'm making there. I'm aware of that. Um, I also was interested in whether people were using the apps at work. Um, somewhat surprisingly, half the people used the apps when at work, probably in their lunch hour. Let's, let's assume they're being professional about this. 
But Grindr continues to deliver messages after you log out and has that very noticeable alert tone, which can be quite distracting. And even when you log out, you may appear on the grid for the next couple of hours. And so messages can be delivered at any point. Logged off doesn't mean the end to the intrusion. 74% of the respondents continued to receive messages at work after they logged out. And that can be quite disruptive for concentration and focus when you're at work. So it does present a bit of a dilemma in terms of how well are we able to keep focused on our work. On average, being contacted by a client or a colleague on an app has happened around three times for our respondents. So it seems really important to have thought through how to handle this in advance, uh, in advance of it happening, and to anticipate that it will happen. This was a quote from one of, the, one of the respondents. I once saw my psychotherapy supervisor online on Grindr and text me his pic, etc. I answered first, then thought, it's inappropriate and he doesn't know who I am, so I deleted him and stopped chatting. The frequency of meeting a client or a colleague in a real-life sexualized context is likely to happen about 1.7 times for our, our respondents. Many respondents were fairly comfortable with running into colleagues in sexualized contexts. They were generally less comfortable when they met their clients there, unsurprisingly. Um, one of the people uh, who responded said, uh, and I think this is kind of ironic, I, it, was reassuring to, well, it was reassuring to find that only one person had ever acted on their attractions when they met their client outside of work. He said, we were drunk. We snogged and had sex. Now, this is a psychotherapist uh, of between five and 10 years' experience um, in the 36 to 45 age bracket. And it, what, was, what was ironic for me was at the end of the survey, when you get that point where you can say anything else, he said, I'm not sure who designed this survey, but it sounds like they sleep around a lot. <laughs> Hot kettle? <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is another quote from somebody. I, I'm in private practice. Colleagues refer to other queer practitioners in the field, and we go to leather events together. It's a sexualized environment, but I've never been sexual with any of them. I have also never been in a play space with a current or former client. Thankfully, I may see current or former clients at leather events I go to, if I go to local leather events, but I don't go to those play spaces. Somebody else said, Choosing to let others see me as a man of both sexual integrity and pride brings some responsibility. I lead with a face pick to help my own boundaries, and so I'm not lulled into a false sense of anonymity. This quote was also interesting. If a client raises in sessions that they go to sex clubs and parties, etc., I would make sure that I had a more, general, more than a general conversation with them about what if we bumped into each other socially? to set up some kinds of boundaries and expectations. I once ran into a client in a sex bar who I had met only once for an assessment fairly recently, but didn't recognize him. He spoke to me and then reminded me who he was. This was a bit tricky. Conveniently, I was leaving for other reasons, although it, did seem to be an issue for, it didn't seem to be an issue for him. I did, on one occasion, look at an online profile and only after looking at the thumbnail pic in full size, realized it was a current client. I brought this up in the next session. I assume they may know this from happening to look at the tracks. It didn't seem to bother them, and they remained in therapy for the whole of treatment without issues. So it's often not going to be an issue for clients, even if it might be an issue for us. Um, and certainly some of my own experiences, clients recognize that we are also inhabiting the same spaces as them, and you can have quite a good conversation about it. Um, if the person subsequently presented for help or treatment, did you refer them to someone else? Most people said, yes, they did. One client identified me from a manhunt profile. He was surprised to see it, but it seemed to deepen our relationship. I think I was seen as more real. Someone else? It's incredibly isolating, but I do, and I do all that I can to avoid being in sexualized spaces where I may run into someone. The exception is when I coordinate fetish dance parties, but they're still fairly reserved and, and I'm standoffish. I mostly end up traveling to hook up and getting my fill that way. 
Do you feel confident to discuss personal and professional boundary issue matters with your managers, supervisors, or colleagues? Most people said yes, but 22% of the respondents didn't feel confident to uh, discuss these out-of-session issues with their colleagues or supervisors. Almost 30% have never spoken about this with their supervisors. This absence of support can pose a challenge as eroticized countertransference is an important issue to be aware of and to work with in order to keep the work safe. I worry about therapists who don't feel able to share their attractions to their clients in through, through supervision or the fact that they run into a client online or in a sauna, etc., and they don't have anywhere to debrief that and work out how to deal with it. I think it's quite important that we find, and I think this was a point that, that Doug was making, yes, making yesterday, that we have supervisors that we can discuss all of ourselves with and not feel that we have to edit or, or manage that presentation to our supervisors. Do you feel you've been understood or offered sufficient support in managing these issues? Most people said yes, but a third felt unsupported or had insufficient support. Only 12% of people didn't feel confident at knowing how to manage the boundary issues, so that's quite good. This is an interesting quote. I've raised this with my supervisor when I've had clients whose profiles I've seen and when they've seen mine. I've raised it with the client as early as possible and discussed how they wanted to proceed. So far, all have been happy with working, carrying on with this working. My having a profile provides confidence that they can talk about kink issues. I've agreed with the clients to block contact. We've negotiated what we do if we meet in a club and the supervisor was made aware of this and she's happy that we're managing the situation. That seemed to be a really good example of ethical boundary management. Three times I found clients' profiles on apps. I've blocked them and I've never brought it up in session. Approaching half the participants hadn't had any training in how to manage these issues and at most didn't feel it didn't felt that it didn't address the implications raised by these apps. So I think this is actually quite an urgent training issue. Has navigating the boundaries affected, negatively affected your personal life? Almost 60% of people feel that their personal life has suffered as a result of having to navigate these complex boundary issues. With almost everyone who answered this question withdrawing from the social or dating scene. And that raises questions. If they're withdrawing from the social and dating scene and not using these apps, how are they managing their sexual and relational needs? Where are they, get, where are they going to with this? Somebody said, I really enjoy working with the LGBT community, but I'm aware of the impact this has had on my personal life with regard to using apps and saunas, etc. I'm always considering moving out of this work in order to allow myself the sexual freedom I had before. And that's someone who's been, in, been working between five and ten years. Somebody said, I wish there was a training session. Living in an isolated, smaller city doesn't give me a lot of choices other than hook up outside of the city. Um, someone else, I think working with a lot of gay men in therapy has distorted my view, works views if gay men, the majority of whom do not access therapy. I have at times not allowed myself to enjoy a fuller personal life for fear of dealing with some of these issues. I'm braver and more creative now, I'm glad to say. I'm really surprised that training courses do not include training on the use of apps for both heterosexual and non-heterosexual cohorts. So many of my straight friends who are counsellors are using Tinder and other hookup apps, and they too have not received any training as part of their programmes on the potential ethical dilemmas of this raises. So it's obviously not just an issue for us, it, it's a wider issue for the whole community. Um, I think that mainstream training organisations are very out of touch with the realities of modern day life for therapists. Here, here. It's made me question if this is the right career for me, if it's going to affect my personal life to such an extent. As a single gay man, it's difficult enough meeting people and he went on, and I have sometimes felt shame about going to saunas and sex clubs. I feel that the message is that I shouldn't. Yeah? 
I'm much more reserved rather than totally withdrawn from the social and dating scenes. I will not engage with any message sent from a blank or anonymous profile, as another tip, for fear if it's a client messaging or testing me. Even profiles with photos and details leave me highly restrained as fish baiting, which is setting up a false profile in order to encourage a meeting and get stood up, is something I've experienced a few times. Or, he says, maybe I was just stood up by somebody who got cold feet. Having a peer group who's willing to listen and challenge has been really important. This is not easy. We're dealing with very complex issues, and I'm glad I have such a peer group. And I think that's another response that we could be making. If we don't feel we can talk about it in supervision, which I think we should be sorting that out, we can maybe try and set up informally a group of peers to talk about it. And my last slide, I probably manage the ethical boundary issues in the main part, in the, in the main part by essentially withdrawing or in large part limiting my social interaction. There is a significant personal cost associated and I would like to find other ethical ways of dealing with these issues. Yeah. And I'm wondering how this is for others of you here. And so let's, um, we'll stop and take some questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you.